right, welcome. Uh, thanks for checking out my talk. Uh, this time I'm gonna get it under 20 minutes. Uh, Metaphysics Incorporated, big topic. The question is what are firms? What is the corporation? Uh, uh, not to give you the whole spiel, but my concept, my, my thinking is that people have, especially in social ontology, kind of just assumed that corporations are groups. Uh, uh, I've even done it on occasion just to, just to like not ruffle any feathers. Uh, but I think that this is uh, an assumption we shouldn't be making. Um, uh, I think that it bears really close relationships to groups of people, but that it's importantly different. Uh, similarly, in legal scholarship, people talk about the firm like it's a kind of legal entity. And I think we also shouldn't think of it that way. So what I wanna do is I wanna give these views try to show or to argue uh, that they are corporations are not these things and then to hoist up a different view this time leaving time to go through some objections to that view and then thinking about some of the advantages so if we're thinking about the debate about whether corporations are morally responsible which would be the debate that really draws in a lot of people into thinking about the nature of the firm to begin with uh, that debate, the fracture line is often from the perspective of how we think about groups. So in other words, uh, we're going to say that corporations are groups, and then whether or not we think they're morally responsible is going to end up coming down to how we think about groups and whether or not groups can be responsible. Um, so very often what happens is that people deny corporate moral responsibility I mean, for other, you know, they do it for a number of reasons, but one prominent reason would be to say that corporations are just groups of people. They're, they're, they're not, you know, they're just a bare plurality of individuals, some collective of individuals, not some kind of group agent. Uh, so here's an example from Manuel Velasquez I won't run through, uh, but we could equally have drawn from uh, John Hasness or Kirk Ludwig, uh, prominent scholars who are uh, denying corporate moral responsibility for metaphysical reasons. Uh, and it's because they're happy to assimilate corporations to groups, but don't take that to be a good thing in terms of corporate moral responsibility. Uh, most proponents of corporate moral responsibility are also happy to take corporations to be groups on the way to arguing for corporate moral responsibility. Um, so for example, here uh, is Kendi Hess and what she's done uh, here and throughout a lot of her work is to try to use more metaphysical resources to buttress uh, the idea of the corporation as a group agent. Uh, so on her view, she's gonna say, uh, borrowing from Lynn Baker's uh, prominent constitution work, uh, she's gonna say that uh, uh, corporations are constituted group agents, constituted by their members, you know, the employees working in concert in particular ways. Uh, uh, for the sake of time, I'll just say, I really like this kind of view. Uh, I think it could be augmented in various ways given what I'm gonna say in, in the future, but uh, there's a lot to be said for it. But for the sake of time, I just, I just can't this time. Uh, advantages, uh, it's, it, if you think corporations are groups and you want them to be responsible, it's, that's great. We've done so much good work in social ontology in terms of thinking about how to think about group mentality, how to think about groups as having mental states, groups as being distinctly responsible, collective responsibility, and all that work can be leveraged to think about corporate responsibility and corporate mentality. If you think corporations are groups, this is a really good thing. I don't, so I think it's a bad thing, but I, if, if you did, it'd be a great way to go. Disadvantage. Uh, is that it seems to ignore corporations, the corporation's relationship to the law. It doesn't quite capture that in a way that you might hope a view of the firm would. Uh, but my objection to be a little bit more fun or a little more lucrative is to point to the fact that it seems like corporations could exist without being groups. Uh, so yes, there are shell corporations, for example, that might not have any members, but still seem to be corporations. You know, in, in, in some sense, it would be good if a view could capture them. Uh, but you could also imagine a company that's fully operational, that does all of the things, but where all of the job, where, where there are no employees. 
So um, uh, Patricia Verhain has this famous example of Robotron. That's this hypothetical corporation that doesn't have employees. I think you can get that kind of case if you think about any corporation today that slowly automates away all of its jobs. Uh, now, there's a question about whether it's the same corporation at the end as at the beginning. Doesn't matter from our perspective, even if it's a different corporation, it's still a corporation. Uh, and there's a kind of back and forth you could have that uh, sort of that draws on Epstein's work and the ant trap, for example, where you could say, oh, well, you know, like uh, the Supreme Court, if uh, if every if everyone resigns at the same time, you could still say there's a Supreme Court and it's a group that just has zero members. It just has these slots to be filled uh, once new justices are appointed. And I think that that's true of those cases, but not true of a corporation that automates away jobs. I don't think that those jobs are just waiting to be filled again or filled by particular robots. Uh, I think that's a weird way to think about what's going on when automation occurs. There's just fewer employees doing more of the things. Uh, the, the closest you could get would be to say that there's still the same number of business functions. And so the firm still is that group of things that perform those business functions. And ultimately that's actually pretty close to my view. I'm gonna say that the corporation is a collection of assets and what are assets except things that are leveraged to perform the business functions. So it's a little bit neither here nor there, but so this is supposed to be the problem with the, uh, with the view that corporation are, are groups of people. Uh, now let's move on to think about this idea of corporations as legal entities. Uh, a lot less on this, but if you're reading uh, uh, law scholarship or management scholarship, it's everywhere. Uh, there's just, just this background assumption that of corp course corporations are just these things in the law. Prominent example here would be Jensen and Meckling. Most organizations are simply legal fictions, which serve as a nexus for a set of contracting relationships among individuals. Uh, they never say what a nexus is, uh, you know, but nevertheless, they take it for granted. Uh, so just as before, we framed the debate over corporate moral responsibility around whether or not you were willing to reify groups or how you were willing to think about groups. Similarly, we could reframe the debate about corporate moral responsibility in terms of exactly how metaphysically serious we're willing to take the law and legal objects. Uh, so you could just take corporations to be legal fictions, uh, which we don't have time to talk about, but I think doesn't make sense. Uh, or you could try to think of corporations on a, on a stronger view of the law, something that sort of sees corporations as objects within an, an institutional reality that's carved by the law. Um, so for example, Cole has an interesting paper uh, arguing that just this appealing to Searle and status functions to try to argue that corporations exist and are abstract and yet can be efficacious in a particular way. It's a long jump from that to something like thinking that they have rights and obligations, but uh, I think that's the kind of route that one could go possibly if you thought corporations were legal entities. So I think there is a way of framing this debate uh, that way. Uh, but it'd be pretty challenging if you were a proponent of corporate moral responsibility to go this route. It'd be very hard, I, I think. Uh, more to the point, uh, you know, there are particular objections besides. So just as we saw a case of corporations that were groups, we could imagine corporations that aren't really legally institutionalized. Uh, so you could imagine a corporation that exists outside the law, for example. Um, you might think something like the mob, like I have here, is an organization of some kind, but not really a, a, a corporation, if you think corporations have to be in the law. Uh, but, you know, you could imagine uh, a shirt manufacturer, say, that uh, is in a company that goes through a, a dramatic revolution that involves a new constitution and new laws being made. Uh, but suppose everyone at the shirt manufacturer, like they just go to work and like they had some supplier issues for a while, but it ended up being okay. And, you know, they stayed, they stayed in the black. Uh, it seems like 
they're the same company, but it, you know, the, the same firm, but it's not, uh, seems like it survived. So th that's the kind of thing you could say about that. But just for the sake of time, this time, we're going to get to my view with time to spare. So here's a nearby proposal to respect. Uh, Tom Donaldson has somewhat explicitly said, hey, maybe we should think of corporations as artifacts. And I think that's a great idea. Uh, a number of other people sort of gesture towards this without saying it outright. Philip Pettit, despite the book, arguing that corporations are, uh, are group agents, uh, or within it, suggesting the corporations are group agents, has separately said uh, in print in a, in a 2017 article that corporations are, are kind of distinct entities from, uh, uh, from any of the members. So there are other people willing to say this. Um, it has some advantage in that it respects uh, the relationship to the law, perhaps. Perhaps they are artifacts, they're legal artifacts, or they're artifacts constructed in the context of the law. You know, there's different ways to go, uh, but it does a little bit more justice than a group view. Uh, it also has the promise of grounding the teleology of corporations. So there's a big debate about how to think about corporate purpose. Uh, uh, Donaldson suggests that we can read off its purpose from the fact that it's an artifact. Uh, he's willing to do that in ways that I would not, that I don't have time to go into, but there's a really promising like line of thought here, given how much work has gone into thinking about the teleology of artifacts and the intentionality of artifacts. And he hasn't, but one could really easily leverage that work to think about corporate purpose. So it's, it's exciting stuff. But disadvantage, uh, uh, I think it's too unspecific. I think that you know we need to ask what kind of artifact it is, and like what, what, what does it really mean that it's an artifact? What, what can we get from that? Enter my view, the view that corporations are assets, uh, or, or the basket of assets, or you know it's what you see on the balance sheet is the is be the just like come on way to way to put it. Um, you know anybody taking accounting. You're, you're regularly capitalizing assets and like looking at the assets on the balance sheet. And one really gets the sense that like, that is the firm. Uh, and so I wanted to try to build a view or to start building a view that respects that more so than I've seen. What is an asset? Uh, that's reasonable next question. And to some extent, this is the, and now that's why we're gonna have this future work part of the talk. Uh, because one thing that I think hasn't been done enough is we as philosophers haven't like engaged sociologically makes a lot of sense why we haven't engaged with accountants to think about like the metaphysical implications or the, the metaphysical grounding for things like assets. But I think it's something we should do. The best they've done, uh, you can see right here, the conceptual framework for financial reporting characterizes assets in a particular way. Uh, they say the future economic benefit embodied in an asset is the potential to contribute directly or indirectly to the flow of cash and cash equivalents to the ent entity. Um, so uh, I only say it just to just to point out that they that accountancy bodies have tried to conceptualize assets, but probably haven't had a whole lot of help from philosophers. And an important thing to note that we're going to come back to is that recognize that they've characterized assets dispositionally in terms of the potential uh, to contribute to future cash flows. So it's objects that have this potential to contribute. Um, and that's gonna be important as an advantage of this kind of view in the end. Um, okay, well, but like, what is the view? Is the view that the corporation is the assets? Is it the group of assets? Is it, is it constituted by the assets? Is it composed by the assets? You know, what, what's, the, what's the view here? Uh, I largely wanna punt this off and say, like, look, uh, metaphysicians are gonna have real hard time talking about whether constitution is, a, is, is, um, is composition, whether composition is identity. Uh, these are great questions, you know, great lines of pursuit. We're gonna be able to appeal to some of them here. Uh, so I would like a view on which corporations are constituted by their assets where assets themselves are particular kinds of uh, kinds of social objects and, and, uh, and corporations are constituted by collections of them. 
Um, so yes, it's a group, but it's a group of assets, not people. So it's very different from the other kind of view. Uh, and just to give a nod of some precedence for this kind of view, uh, in a 2017 paper, Hawley's characterizing corporations, uh, and uh, and she says right here that um, well, she she characterizes them as involving people, but then also involving buildings, equipment, and so on. And I see this as kind of a like it's it's the one time where I saw someone say. No, it's not just it, it's not just employees. It's the buildings, and it's it's all of the assets, and that's really I think the key thing is it's the assets. Um, uh, there's a lot to say about how it relates to the other views that I won't get into for the sake of time. Uh, it's fairly apparent how it relates to those views. I think it's very dramatically different from the view on which the corporation is a group of people. And so even if we say, well, it's still a group of assets, it's still a very kind of different view. Um, now let's go through some problems that might immediately pop up to you about this view. And if you wanna think more about it, these are on the handout. Uh, first objection, uh, liquid asset, you know, the firms have cash. Uh, should we really say that the cash is a part of the firm? Uh, you know, just these liquid assets that are always coming in and out of the firm. Uh, this is a bit of a softy uh, of an objection because, of course, we regularly lose and replace our parts. Uh, so it's no surprise that firms would also be able to do this. Uh, so just moving on. Uh, hey, you mentioned shell corporations earlier. Do those have assets? And if they don't have assets, isn't that a problem for the view? That's the objection. Um, this is where I will do something a bit like Epstein and say, oh, it is the assets. It's just that sometimes firms are assetless, uh, but they're still firms, but they're still, they're just understood in terms of the assets they don't have, uh, perhaps. And this one is a newer objection I thought of that I just need to think more about. So if, if you, we want to have a discussion about that, that'd be cool. But I think there are things to, to be said here. Uh, for example, a follow-up problem you might have is uh, if shell companies have no assets and the firm is its assets, don't, doesn't that mean that all shell, shell companies are identical, that they're all the same company? Um, and my response is going to be something to the tune of, well, firms are constituted by their assets. They're not identical with those assets. So, you know, a firm, the same assets, it, I don't think that the same assets could constitute more than one firm, but uh, yeah, it could be here that um, it, just because it's the same non-assets, it doesn't mean it's the same firm. Very quick way to get about it. All right, for the sake of time. Third objection. Uh, I have a car, well, I don't have a car, but imagine I had a car. Uh, uh, it's an asset that I own. Uh, I, I'm not a company, like I'm not a firm. Uh, how are we supposed to distinguish this? In fact, we distinguish between Kenneth, the, the man versus Kenneth, the estate, uh, you know, the, my estate and my, my estate has this hypothetical car as a part of it. Uh, aren't I making some kind of confusion here insofar as I'm confusing the firm with the firm's estate or the, of the assets it has? And I wanna say that I'm just very different from a firm. It's, it's not even just that uh, uh, in terms of me being made up of different stuff, I'm like fundamentally a biological being. You know, We could look to accounts of personhood that un understands us as animals or as biological entities. And if we were trying to think of what corporations are, we wouldn't characterize them the same way. They would be financial things or financial vehicles or financial objects. So I, I think that's a way to go. Uh, there's other things to say. The, the last thing I'll say here is just that it, it's not just that uh, uh, just, just because there are some assets doesn't mean there's a corporation. Critical to corporations is that they have the ability, they have asset lock-in. So other people don't have asset, a, access to those assets. Uh, and that's an important feature that might distinguish firms. Really quick advantages. Uh, um, it, we no longer are assimilating corporations to groups. Now we can see that maybe the best way to model corporate mentality and responsibility is not by thinking about collective mentality and collective responsibility. Um, so 
maybe we're looking for something different. Uh, another advantage is it gives us a very concrete way to think about locating firms. Uh, and I don't have time to get into it, but there has been this recent fund discussion about the location of establishments, say, uh, uh, and, and other social objects that seem abstract. And this provides particular tools for handling that or, or engaging with that. Uh, and the last thing I want to say really quickly is just that firms are, uh, insofar as their assets and insofar as assets are understood dispositionally in terms of what they can do, it kind of nicely gives us a way for thinking of firms as agents. Because if we think about agents in terms of their abilities, where abilities are understood dispositionally on some accounts, now we have a way of thinking about corporations as agents that have abilities that are defined by their assets and what their assets are capable of. Um, so that's very quickly the thing I'll say about that. Only thing I'll say is that this should encourage us to think more about the metaphysics of, uh, of important issues and accounting beyond the really good recent work that's been done on the metaphysics of money, and that I take this to be uh, a step towards that. Uh, so thank you.